Hello and welcome. I am Luke Milky, and today we're going to be covering unmanned aerial system mission planning. For an overview, we're going to be going into understanding the area, understanding your equipment, developing a plan, and introducing a possibly new topic to some of you, the named area of interest, and then applying a search strategy to that named area of interest. Starting with understanding the area, there are several key factors we need to consider, first being air traffic, terrain, vegetation, man-made obstacles, and weather. Starting with air traffic, we need to maintain situational awareness on the other aircraft that are operating in the area that we're going to be operating the UAS in. For this, I use the application Flight Aware. So based on where you are, the little blue dot, it shows other aircraft flying in the vicinity of the area and clicking on each one of those will give you a tail number, the speed, and the altitude. It'll help you see what else is flying in that area. However, it doesn't cover low-flying helicopters or emergency services activity. For that, I'm going to use the application Air Map. Those areas will be marked with a red circle and be labeled like wildfire, um, emergency services activity, and things like that. Just to let you know that even though something might not be flying in there, it's still a flight restricted area and will have low flying aircraft involved. The next is terrain. For this, we're going to use the example of Spruce Mountain. And we have a lost hiker on the trails. This area is a plateau surrounded by grassy fields. And if we take a look at the topo map, we see that it starts out at 7,200 feet down below and rises all the way to 7,600 feet at the top of the plateau. Let's take a look at the cross section of that plateau. So again, starting at 7,200 feet, going all the way up to 7,600 feet. With FAA regulations in mind, we can fly 400 feet above ground level. So that starts us at 7,600 feet, rising all the way up to 8,000 feet. The terrain is a special consideration when we're looking at things like visual line of sight. So if you're standing at the bottom of the plateau, you'll be able to look at an entire side of a cliff and some of the airspace that's located above the plateau. But this entire area will not be visible to the operator. So what if we consider putting a visual observer on the top? So we have the cliffs on either side that'll limit our line of sight below those cliffs. However, if you're trying to just search on the top of the plateau, you have a wide open airspace above you that you'll be able to observe the UAS in. We also might consider placing the visual observer on the edge of the cliff. This will give them visual line of sight over the edge, but not totally up against that cliff, and then across the entire top of the plateau. Again, blocked by the cliff on the other side, but this may be an option for you. You may also consider using more than one visual observer, so placing one in the lower section and then one on the edge will give you 100% coverage of this side of the plateau. Next is vegetation. There are three types of vegetation. So wide open, so low-lying grass, and that will be fairly easy to search through. The next is going to be tall grass or bushes. It'll be a little bit more difficult, especially if the subject is lying on the ground, uh, maybe hidden from view. So you might have to consider that when building your search strategy. And then finally we have tall trees or vegetation. It's going to present the largest challenge to searching with the UAS. So we'll take a closer look at that. So let's suppose our subject is in the middle walking down a trail and there's tall trees on either side of the trail. While we're planning our flight route, if we plan it to be off-centered just a little bit from the trail, vegetation will block our view of that trail. You may still be able to get a glimpse through some of those treetops but it'll be very difficult. So we need to maintain situational awareness on where the actual UAS is and try to fly directly over the trail to look down below. You may have some overhang, but this will still give you the best opportunity to spot your subject. Next is man-made obstacles. So if we're trying to look into an area and we're using topo maps, we'll see that some of them are actually marked like the windmill in a red circle. And then we look at the satellite map, here's that same windmill. It does mark some other buildings, roads, other low-lying structures. However, if we look on the satellite map, we see some telephone poles or 
electric poles with shadows being cast, those also present a hazard to the UAS. And then the power lines in between those. The best way to mitigate this is actually do a visual check of the area before flight and mark all potential obstacles on your map. Make sure you mitigate those with your flight plan and try to avoid running into those. The next is weather. So we need to consider temperature extremes. If it's too hot, the motors need to work harder to generate lift. If it's too cold, it'll affect the batteries, and we'll go over that in a little bit. And rain, sleet, and sl snow are no good for the UAS. Fog will still get the UAS wet. And even if your UAS is weatherproofed, it'll still cause obstructions. The precipitation will build up on the lens. And then prolonged exposure to humidity could cause damage to the components of the UAS. Wind will also drain the battery. We'll cover that in more detail in a little bit. Next section is understanding your equipment. For this, we need to look at FAA limitations, battery life, and sensor capabilities. The main FAA limitations that we'll be looking at are going to be the 400 feet above ground level, visual line of sight, and hours of darkness. All of these are a big consideration in mission planning for search and rescue. All three of these can be waived, and you can Google that process and submit that through the FAA to get those waived. If you need more detail on these restrictions, you can check out the FAA.gov link below and go to the Remote Pilot Study Guide for more information. So looking at battery life, cold temperatures definitely affect the actual fly time and the battery capability. Most of these are built with um, the 80 degree Fahrenheit in mind, so you'll have a 0% capacity decrease. So your flight time will be maxed out with the DJI Mavic Pro, as long as there's no other factors like wind or anything like that, and it'll be at 25 minutes. When you drop the temperature all the way down to zero degrees Fahrenheit, you only get 50% of that battery life. So your flight time will be dropped down to 12.5. Most DJI drones are rated down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So you won't get that low, but it's still consideration to keep that in mind when you're planning your mission. If it's colder, you have shorter flight times. Next is wind speed, so drone speed is on the left, so 10 miles per hour all the way up to 40, and then wind speed at the top, zero, all the way to 40 miles an hour. So let's take an example of flying at 20 miles an hour and a headwind of 5 miles an hour. You'll only get 75% efficiency out of that battery, dropping it by 25%, because the drone has to use more energy to maintain that 20 mile per hour speed. This is going to reduce your flight time from 25 minutes to a little less than 19 minutes. Of course, as the wind speed goes up, your efficiency drops. Moving into sensor capabilities, you need to consider resolution. If you don't have a great camera, you might not be able to spot smaller objects on the ground. And the higher the resolution, the better, of course. And then streaming quality is another big consideration. The data that's being recorded to the memory card on the device is going to be of higher quality than that of on your iPad or smartphone. You also have to consider if you're streaming to other devices, like the command post or a video operator. Their resolution may be different, and they may not be able to spot the same things that the remote pilot on command can see on their device. And last, because of that higher resolution of onboard memory, Post-flight analysis is very important. Does the UAS have the capability to store and transfer that data to be reviewed in the command post or on a laptop or at a later time? And then if your UAS has a thermal sensor on board, a consideration is thermal crossover. This phenomenon is when you have a cold object and the sun rises and begins to warm up that background temperature and the cold object starts to get warm, at some point their temperature difference will not be great enough for the sensor to distinguish between the background temperature and the actual object. So it will be almost invisible to the sensor. This happens at two times during the day, as it's heating up and then again as it's cooling off. The chart to the right shows the thick dashed line, tree trunks, the little dotted line is going to be grass and tree leaves that has a sharp spike, 
So you can see grass and tree leaves cool off faster than tree trunks. And I know we're not looking at armored targets, however, it's the same principles as looking for a truck or items of clothing. Still has that thermal crossover. Once we take a look at all those considerations and look at the area and the equipment and how the environment's going to affect your UAS, we need to develop a plan. For that, we're going to start with a named area of interest. This is where we're going to section off the area that we're going to search. This can be a specific point on the ground or specific movement route or even just an area. For this, there's several considerations. We need to look at the terrain. So in this example, we have Area Alpha and Bravo are on the top of the plateau. Charlie, Delta, Echo, and Foxtrot are on the lower portions of that plateau. We also need to look at size. So Area Charlie is pretty big, and depending on the temperature or the wind, you might need to cut that down based on flight time. So this might need to be divided up into three different sections. You want to keep each named area of interest limited to one period of flight or one battery then visual line of sight might also be an issue. Maybe it's too difficult to see all of this, so for instance if I combined Alpha and Delta, I might not be able to see a small strip right along the cliff, so that wouldn't be a good boundary. And then order those in priority based on the likelihood that your subject will be in that area and the difficulty for ground crews to search that area. So maybe Area Alpha is the most likely place that we'll find our subject, However, Delta is very difficult to transverse because of swampy areas or large cliffs or something else like that. Maybe we want to have the UAS search Delta, even though it's a lower priority first, just because of that difficulty. And then once we have our named areas of interest, we're going to apply a search strategy. So the first one is point, the second is route, and the third and final is grid. Let's say we have information that our subject is located in Area Alpha, up in that north-eastern corner of it. It wouldn't make very much sense to fly a large grid pattern or a route search that takes up lots of time and batteries. So we'll just fly a straight route directly over to that area and set up an orbit that circles that area looking for the subject. It's pretty simple and straightforward. And then moving into the route search. So Area Charlie is fairly large, but maybe we don't need to search all of the grasslands or we want to just focus on the trails because the subject is known to never leave the trail. So we're going to identify the routes that we want to search, starting from the parking lot, flying out along the grasslands directly over the route or the trail itself, and then maybe flying over to the other trail and picking that up. And then because of the vegetation and tall trees, flying directly over this trail again all the way back to the parking lot to search that route. And the final one, if there's very limited information and the subject is most likely off trail at this point, we're going to look at Area Bravo and we would actually set up a grid search to search that entire area. This would probably be best served using images shooting straight down and then being processed in the command post or on the laptop later to review those images and try to identify any objects of interest or the subject. So in this lesson we covered understanding the area, understanding your equipment, developing a plan, introducing the named area of interest, and then applying a search strategy to that named area of interest. This lesson was unmanned aerial systems mission planning. For more information or additional resources, please check out lukemilkey.com.